All right, next up, we have um, uh, Jeffrey May here. OK, great, um, from uh, Wayfair. And um, we will be continuing on the topic of uh, next item recommendation. Uh, thank you. So uh, I don't see the notes on my, OK, perfect. So, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Jeffrey, a senior data scientist on the personalization team at Wayfair. And I'm here to talk about our uh, latest model for our next item furniture recommendations. So our model uh, called Mars is based off SASREC, and it uses multi-headed self-attention and uh, transformer architecture with a single input, which is the list of previously viewed items in the order in which they were viewed uh, to generate these recommendations. And we can see it in action here. Uh, initially, I'm seeing these default recs, which are basically just bestsellers because I have no browsing history. And as I generate some page views, I'm going to click on these kind of blue abstract art rugs, which I like. And after I've clicked on a few of these, I can refresh the page and you can see that the resulting recommendations are now much more uh, stylistically consistent with this kind of abstract blue uh, art theme that I said I liked. So let's talk quickly about evaluation. Uh, here we show the top six recommendations provided for four different customers, and the ordered item is highlighted in red, and these are in positions three, five, and one for the first three customers, and the fourth customer has no successful prediction at all. Uh, because we are evaluating on the next order, there's only one right answer, and this has relevancy one. All other recommendations have relevancy zero. This means that the ideal gain per customer is also one, and this simplifies the NDCG calculation greatly because uh, each customer has a score of either one over the positional discount or zero, as shown here. And as a note, the standard discount for NDCG is log of base two, and we will return to this point later. Uh, I, I, below, I also show the recall calculation, uh, and another way to think of this is basically just NDCG with no positional discount. So recall and NDCG are both very common standard metrics to use for evaluation. And at Wayfair, we show 48 items per page. So it's very natural for us to use a recall or, or NDCG at 48 to do our offline evaluation. And here you can see the offline evaluation results for one of our models for our uh, Wayfair UK store. Uh, you can see a big lift for both metrics at position 48. So you would think we should go ahead and do an A-B test. Uh, here I should mention that a control is just a deep neural network based off the YouTube paper from 2016. But our A-B test actually failed. Uh, this was very surprising to us, uh, and so let's look at why this was. Uh, you can see that Mars is uh, losing to control for the top six positions uh, and then winning after that. And so this suggests that we need to uh, discount or weight the top positions more. NECG does do this uh, using that log two thing, but clearly not enough because NECG also predicts a successful test. So how can we figure out the right discount rate? So to do this, uh, we can look at our historical interaction data by position. So uh, you can see that they all follow a fairly monomial relationship, which means we can fit a straight line to it on a log-log plot. And here I show the exponents for uh, click-through, add to cart, and order rates. And because we are using orders for our evaluation, uh, we want to use this discount of uh, x to the 1.02. So to apply this discount to position x, instead of doing the original uh, dividing by log base 2 thing, uh, and we will instead divide by the position x to the 1.02. And we will call this the empirical NDCG. Uh, note that just as before, the ideal gain is still 1 because uh, 1 over 1 to the 1.02 is still 1. Uh, the, in this particular formulation for this exponent, uh, you, because it's so close to 1, the sharp-eyed viewer may spot that this particular empirical NDCG is very closely approximated by the mean reciprocal rank. Though obviously this is not generally true for the other exponents. Uh, so using this empirical discount, we can see that control actually wins over our model now. Uh, and this is uh, the correct uh, prediction of our AP test result. So this highlights the danger of using NECG blindly without customizing the discount for your actual observed real positional effect. Uh, below, we also show the different discount rates. Uh, you can see that even the most gentle discount for um, page views is still much steeper than the standard logarithmic discount, which is simply too small for our real observed positional effect. So now we've figured out how to correctly evaluate our models to show that uh, it would not beat control. So now let's actually beat control. 
uh, after some investigation, it turned out that our Wayfair UK model was suffering from thin data. So some background here, Wayfair has uh, stores in uh, the US, UK, Canada, and Germany, as well as some specialty stores in the US market. Um, and these will have very different catalog sizes, ranging from you know, tens of thousands to tens of millions of items and very different traffic volumes. So to compare the data thinness, we measure the distribution of the number of customers viewing each distinct item in each store's catalog. And as we increase the training period and include more customers in training, uh, naturally, this means our data will get denser. So our first test for all stores used the same 30-day look back, which is that leftmost purple box plot. And you can see that the A-B test result below is heavily correlated to the data thinness. The worst performing stores in the A-B test all have the thinnest data. So to improve the performance of these stores, we basically tried to align their data density uh, with the Wayfair US store. And we did this fairly arbitrarily using uh, the 25th percentile of the Wayfair US uh, as a yardstick. And this was simply because the Wayfair US is a larger store and it was a successful test. So for example, you can see for Wayfair UK, which is what I showed earlier, we need to use 90 days, which is that green box plot, before the 21st percentile exceeds uh, um, the Wafer US 21st percentile, which is that dotted red line. Oh. Oh. Let's go back to the starting. So now let's look at the increased, uh, what happens when we use this increased training set size. We can see that the empirical NDCG also improves. Uh, for our original 30 day model, you can see that um, it's losing to control as we showed earlier, which is that dotted yellow line. Using 60 days of data in green narrowly beats it. Using 90 days in orange very comfortably beats it. And by 120 days, uh, we are beginning to see diminishing returns, which is that light purple line. Uh, increasing training data obviously increases, increases the training time, in our case, more or less linearly. And so 90 days is a good trade off for accuracy versus training time. So when we A-B tested this new model with 90 days of data, this was a big win for our conversion rate. And more importantly, this means we were able to match our real A-B test result to our offline evaluation. So now let's see what Mars is actually learning. So uh, during training, we are only passing in, passing in a list of strings uh, which correspond to the product names, and these are mapped to a dictionary of learned item embeddings. So when we compare these learned item embeddings, here are shown projected into 2D using UMAP, uh, we can see that uh, we can compare these to other attributes like, for example, uh, price, popularity, and externally provided style and functionality tags. We can see good overall agreement. And again, none of this information is provided to Mars at training time, so it's learning all of these implicitly. For example, I want to know that it's learning to group together items that are similarly priced, but not simply because they are similarly priced, but rather because they are similarly priced uh, sofas, which also share, for example, a functionality, which is that rightmost uh, plot. These attributes are learned on a continuum. Uh, for attributes like price and popularity, this makes sense because they are already continuous variables. But for things like functionality, it's quite interesting because they are typically categorical. You can see, for example, that uh, this convertible sofa is in this kind of transition zone between uh, sleeper sofas and uh, standard sofas. And uh, this makes sense because customers who are trying to buy a sleeper sofa may actually be happy with a convertible sofa and vice versa. In contrast, customers who want a reclining sofa commonly found in home movie theaters or curved back sofas uh, are really dead set on what they want and are not typically interested in browsing other types of sofas. So more generally, we can look at some of Wafer's top order categories. And here, the colors represent different types of furniture. And again, this information is not provided at training time, but the model nevertheless can learn this implicitly. We can see that Mars is learning to group together items of the same type, which are these colored clusters. And it, in addition, it's learning to group together similar types. For example, in the bottom left, you can see that uh, pillows and curtains and uh, bedding sets are all grouped together because they are presumably commonly co-browsed types. Uh, additionally, you can see that there are areas of the chart where there are many different colors, which means that there are many different types of furniture being clustered together. And these are being clustered on different attributes other than category, for example, style, functionality, or material. Uh, note, for example, beds, which are the points in the navy blue, are kind of scattered throughout this chart. Uh, and I've included an example in each of these clusters to show that the beds are being clustered with not necessarily other beds, but with other furniture that share, for example, the same style or material. 
So we saw from the last slide that Mars is learning this category component in its item embedding. And so to compare items from different categories, we have to remove this, otherwise it dominates the signal. And we find that in general, commonly co-ordered categories like, for example, pillows and bedding sets are highly similar to each other. So we demean each embedding by removing its category's average. So now we can compare the similarity between items uh, for uh, item embeddings for both browsed and non-browsed, i.e. random items. And we can see that the similarity of browsed items for both same category and cross-category browse is uh, significantly higher than for random items, which has almost no similarity, as we might expect. Uh, for in-category items, this makes sense because I showed that Mars is learning things like, for example, functionality for sofas, which informs customer browse. Uh, for cross-category browse, Items may still share, for example, material, for example, um, beds and nightstands may both be wooden, but they may also be two different types of furniture that do not share uh, uh, physical attributes. For example, like a leather sofa and like a marble or glass uh, coffee table do not share uh, shape or material attributes at all. And instead, the attribute that is consistent that accounts for the similarity must be something more abstract like style, which I also showed that Mars is able to learn. So to summarize our findings, we found that the standard logarithmic discount for NDCG is insufficiently strong, and we needed to empirically determine our own discount by looking at historic order rates by, by position, and that this enabled us to align our offline evaluation results with our real A-B test results. We also found that data thinness can be kind of diagnosed and tracked by measuring the number of customers viewing each item, and that by standardizing this across our different models, we were able to ensure that they were all winning their individual A-B tests. Lastly, we showed that our model is able to learn very powerful embeddings that capture, uh, for example, style and functionality and material uh, entirely implicitly without using any uh, other information other than customer item interactions. Uh, so thanks for your time. Uh, the link to the paper is on the, is on the left and uh, my contact details on the right, and I'm happy to take questions. All right, thank you. So I have a question, and it's related to some of the things that are here. Um, there isn't anything particularly sacred about NDCG. It's really just kind of a mathematical abstraction of a certain browsing model that's supposed to capture you know, how people's attention you know, is, is focused on a list of items. Um, so I'm wondering if you had thought about kind of developing your own kind of browsing model and uh, as opposed to just trying to find a new parameter for, for an existing um, uh, metric like that? Uh, so I, I guess the way I would do that is by looking at historic uh, um, interaction data by position, which I guess is going, which ends up back at NDCG. Um, I guess we could look at different gains. Uh, for example, if we look at uh, multiple items which actually end up being ordered. There's no particular reason why we should use the next order. We could use uh, different gains for that, uh, but we haven't really explored that. Uh, but it's a good good question. Um, there's also some folks interested in see if you could um, provide more details on the model architecture and the training, sort of the specifics of, of what we're seeing. Sure. So uh, I, for that, I would like to plug my Friday talk in the car session. I'll go into a lot more detail about that. It's mostly based off that strike. We made a few tweaks to account for for example, the fact that customers like to typically order uh, previously viewed items a lot more than uh, newly uh, new items which they like to click on but not necessarily order. So we it's so again so it's mostly based off Sasrek with a few kind of minor tweaks to account for our domain. Um, and and I guess you you've explicitly kind of not included any metadata here, um, and so I guess the question is. Um, do you think it would be valuable to include that, things like images or you know, uh, category information, which you, you, you sort of can infer, but, but maybe um, there would be benefits to doing right. that? Yeah, yeah. So, for, so we are looking to uh, include other features. I, I think images probably is the best one of, to inform things like style. Uh, for other, other kinds of attributes, like, uh, for example, the style tag or functionality tag, one issue is that, uh, firstly, they don't typically uh, transfer well between different types of furniture. So you know we can say we can say a modern nice stand very easily, but we cannot say like a modern dishwasher very easily. Um, well, I guess we could, I guess. Um, but and and in addition, many tags are missing. So for example, for functionality, uh, many of many items uh, may be missing tags or 
you don't have manufacturer supply tags, and when you have a catalog of you know tens of millions of items, it's very unworkable. All right, that's good. Okay, so let's thank our speaker, and we'll move on to the next presentation.